Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We have finished doing almost all the problems from here, all the math problems from this book. If there's any math problem at all that gives you trouble and if you wish to watch the solution to it, you will find the solutions to almost all the problems, all the math problems from this book from day number 251 through 400, from 251 through 400. This book, by the way, happens to contain the exact same problems in most cases and again appearing on exactly the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We are finished doing all the problems from this book. In the event that you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. From day number 1 through 250. The original solutions tend to be a little lengthier, they tend to be a little bit more in depth. Right now, we are in the process of solving some quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions, as you know, are a very important part of the exam. They are a big chunk of the exam. They have not gone away. Unfortunately for us, the newer books do not provide us with enough quantitative comparison questions to practice on. For that reason, from day number 401, we began solving quantitative comparison questions out of this book here, the 10th edition of the General GRE. And right now, we are on page number 361. We are in the very last test in the book. The book contains seven exams, and right now we are in exam number seven, and that's going to go on from 461 to 470. 470 is going to be the last video from this book where, we'll, where, we'll, where we will have finished all the quantitative comparison questions from this book. There are a total of 210 problems, 30 problems, 30 math, 30 quantitative comparison questions in each exam, and as I said, there are seven exams in it. Let's take a look at it. Pro problem that we are about to do is problem number six. Problem number six, as it, when it appeared in the exam, 76% of the people had no trouble with it, three quarters of the people got it right. Here is what we are being asked to compare. 4n squared versus 2n plus 1 times 2n minus 1. Now is there anything else we are told about this n or not? No, that's it. There is nothing, there is nothing else that we are told. We are, being simply, we are simply being asked to compare 4n squared versus 2n plus 1 times 2n minus 1. I'll, I'll be quiet now, pause the video, do the problem yourself, and then once you have done the problem yourself, then compare your work against the work that you and I will do in a few seconds together. You must always do that in every single problem. You must pause the video instinctively, even if I don't remind you. Do you understand? Here we go. Well, here we go. We have 2n plus 1. This 2n, this 2n plus 1 is same as a plus b. And here we have a minus b. Now, do you remember the formula of a plus b times a minus b? a plus b times a minus b comes from a squared minus b squared. If you were to, if you were to expand, if you were to foil this thing, if you were to open this thing, you will find that it's a squared minus b squared. Our a, our a here is 2n, our a is 2n, so this is 2n squared, 2n whole squared, 2n squared minus 1 squared. 2n squared, 2n squared is just 4n squared minus 1. And here also we have 4n, 4n squared. We see 4n squared here, we see 4n squared here, it serves no purpose, it's just there to annoy us. Let's subtract 4n squared from both sides. Let's subtract 4n squared from both sides. If we do that, it goes away. Here we are left with 0 versus negative 1. The answer is the answer is a. 0 is more than negative 1. The answer is a. Number 7. Question number 7. Question number seven, when it appeared in the exam, 
72% of the people has no trouble with it. We have A and B and we are told that A and B are both greater than greater than 0 and less than 1. So we are being told that we have two quantities A and B and both of these quantities, both of these quantities right here, both of them are greater than 0 and less than 1. And what we are being asked to compare, what we are being asked to compare, let's put them here. In column A we have A squared plus B squared and in column B we have A plus B. A squared plus B squared versus a plus B. Again, I'll give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video to be able to pause and unpause the video. Do the problem yourself and then compare your work, as always, with the work that we will about to do together in a few seconds. Okay? Here we go. Alright, here we go. We are being told that A and B are both Greater than, greater than 0 and less than 1. Well, if they're greater than 0 and less than 1, that implies that both, both A and B are positive fractions. Both A and B are positive fractions. Okay, stay with me in the story. And what do we know about positive fractions? Well, we know that when positive fraction, when when a positive when a positive fraction is squared, what happens when you square a positive fraction? When a positive fraction is squared, it gets smaller. It gets smaller. For example, for example, if we have a half, if we have a half, that's a positive fraction. If we square it, if we square it, it becomes one-fourth. And of course, one-fourth is less than the original fraction that we started out with. If we have if we have 1 over 10, if we have 1 over 10 to start out with, again, it's a positive fraction between 0 and 1. If you square it, what do we know? What do you know what happens when you square it? When you square it, it's going to be less than what we started out with. So that's what this is. We know that. That's a, that's a simple fact that, of course, we understand it. We know that when a, when a positive fraction is squared, it gets smaller. Are you with me? What does it tell us? It tells us, therefore that tells us, that this a squared that we see, this a squared has to be less than a. We also know that this b squared that we see, this b squared that we see, has to be less than b. Now let's add them up. If we add, add up the two quantities here, if you add up the two, in, two inequalities, we, what we find is that a squared plus b squared, because, because the fact that a squared is less than a and b squared is less than b, therefore the sum of the a squared and the b squared would have to be less than the sum of a, b. a squared plus b squared would have to be less than a, b. The answer is b. That's all. a squared plus b squared would have to be less than a plus b. Why? Because a squared is less than a and b squared is less than b. Therefore, their sum is going to be less than the original quantity, sum of the original quantity a and b, Qu original quantities rather, a and b. Number eight. Number eight. Let's see what we have in number eight. Number eight is a geometry problem. Number eight, when it appeared in the exam, 62% of people had no trouble with it. We are given a simple picture, we are, we are not told anything at all, we are simply given a picture here, and picture looks like this. And we are told that this is x, this is y, and this is z. That's all it is, that's all they tell you. I'm reproducing every time, I always reproduce the problem exactly as it appears in the exam obviously because anything less or anything more would no longer represent the real exam. This is the real exam. This is how it appeared in the exam. That's the picture that you see there. Nothing else is told, nothing else is told about the, about the, about the triangle. Let's see what they're asking. Number eight. 
we're being asked to compare column A versus column B. In column A we have x plus y and in column B we have z. Pause the video and do it yourself. I'll give you five seconds to pause and then pause the video. Alright, the only concept that they're testing here, the only concept that they're testing here is that they want to know that they want to know if you understand that in any triangle, in any triangle, doesn't matter what shape of the triangle is, whether it's an isosceles triangle or right angle triangle or equilateral triangle or obtuse triangle or acute triangle or an ugly triangle. In any triangle, in any triangle, the sum the sum of two sides is always greater than the third side. In any, in any triangle, the sum, S-U-M, sum of two sides is always, sum of two sides is always greater than the third side any two sides. Why is that? Why is the sum of the two sides in a given triangle greater than the third side? Well, let's, let's, take, a, let's take a quick look at it. Let's, quick, let's take a quick look at it intuitively, even though it's a very simple concept. Here's a triangle right here. Here's another triangle right here. Here's another triangle right here. A, B, and C. If you take any two sides, if you take any two sides, the sum is going to be more than the third side. Why is that? Well, it's a very simple reason. Let's call this point P point Q and point R. If I want to drive from point A, if I want to drive from point P, from town P to town Q, I have two choices here. I can either take a direct route, a straight line that joins point P and point Q, which of course is the shortest distance, and because it's the shortest distance, therefore by definition, because the straight line is the shortest distance, this, the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line, Therefore, by definition, therefore, by definition, any detour that you take, any detour that you take, no matter what the shape of the detour is, you'll end up driving more than the straight line. And therefore, if I were to go from P to R and then from R to Q, of course, I'm going to end up driving more. The sum of these two sides, of course, is going to be more than the third side. That's what it is here. X plus Y is the sum of the two sides. Sum of the two sides will always be more than the third side. That's all. The answer is A. The answer is A. By the way, before I forget it, if you're curious, I'm going to make a note here somewhere. Or can we make a note? I left no room anywhere. Let's put a note here. Before I, before I erase the problem and it's gone forever. I would like you to watch this, this problem that we just did. Problem number 8 that we just did. It's very similar to, to the problem number 8 on page number 227 which appeared on day number 422 422 as a matter of fact if I if my memory serves me correct if, if my memory serves me right if my memory serves me right I, I recall that the percentile was also for this number 8 was also around 61 or 62 percent same of course it's going to be very similar very same because this, this, this exam, RGRE that you're preparing for, is a standardized exam. It's a very predictable beast. This animal is not, uh, it's not something uh, very difficult to understand. It's a very predictable, all standardized exam. All standardized exams are very predictable in their nature. There are, there are no surprises here. If this was 62 percentile, this is also going to be somewhere very close to it. If you're interested in comparing the two problems, number 8 on page number 227, which we did on four, day number 422, you can compare the two. Let's go on to number 9. Question number 9. Question number 9. Question number 9, when it appeared in the exam, 59% of people had no trouble with it, about, about 3 three fifths of the people got it right. What we're being asked to compare is 3 raised to x versus 4 raised to x. Column A, column B, 
and that is all. That's all there is. There, there is nothing else there. I'll be quiet now. You do it yourself. 3 rest to x versus 4 rest to x. I'll give you 5 seconds to do the problem yourself. Okay, here we go. I didn't mean to say that I'll give you 5 seconds to do the problem yourself. What I meant to say is that I'll give you 5 seconds to pause and unpause the video so that you can do the problem yourself. Well, what, what do we do here? 3 rest to x versus 4 rest to x. We have talked about this thing many a times. We have talked about this thing many a times in the GRE and we're going to talk about it one more time here. In the GRE, when you're, when you're, doing, when you're doing the quantitative comparison questions, you must always remind yourself that the numbers come in two flavors. Listen very carefully. Numbers come in two flavors. As many, 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 many moons ago as a young schoolboy or schoolgirls, we learned about positive numbers and negative numbers and odd numbers and even numbers of rational numbers and irrational numbers and uh, this number and that number. Similarly, in the GRE, the numbers come in two flavors. Numbers come in two flavors. There are nice numbers and there are nasty numbers. Always remember, nice numbers and nasty numbers. What's the nastiest of all numbers? The nastiest of all is zero. Then we have one, then we have negative, and then we have fractions. You must always try them. You must always try them in this order. Don't go all over the place. First try a nice number. Nice number would be any positive number, positive whole number, other than one that is. And of course, if you do that, you will find that if you plug in, or even actually, in this particular case, actually, I just realized, in this particular case, you don't have to worry about it. You don't even have to worry about the nice numbers. Just try the nasty numbers and you will see immediately what, what happens here. Pl plug in 0 here, plug in 0 here, the first one here, and then let's go in this sequence. If you plug in 0 here, 3 raised to 0 versus 4 raised to 0. And of course we know that any number raised to 0 equals 1. Any number, doesn't matter what that number is. 37 raised to 0 is 1, negative 22.4 raised to 0 is 1, 1 million raised to 0 is 1, any number, any number n raised to 0 is 1. 3 raised to 0 is 1. And 4 raised to 0 is 1. Answer is C in this case. Let's try 1 now. If x happens to be 1, if x happens to be 1, if x happens to be 1, we have 3 raised to 1 versus 4 raised to 1. 3 raised to 1 versus 4 raised to 1. Before the answer was C, now the answer is not C. That's it, we are done. Before it was C, now, now it's not C, therefore the answer is D. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.